Well, we, um, we're going to deal with the topic of doubt. The, the person that Jesus was here at this point in time, he was someone who was obviously bringing miracles and he was explaining himself and who he was to the people. And yet they come out in the middle of all of this and they ask him this question, how long dost thou make us to doubt? You would think, boy, there would be nothing to doubt in Jesus' ministry at this point. If you look back just a chapter earlier, he had healed the blind man. He had done many other miracles. He had explained as a teacher, as a rabbi, things that they didn't understand, that they didn't think he was capable of. He, he had given them illustrations. He had gone through this illustration, I'm the good shepherd. And no one comes to the Father but by me. And there seems like it should be obvious. It shouldn't be a question. And yet here they are still questioning and doubting and wondering exactly who Jesus was and what this all meant. And you know, I think it's probably true for all of us. We live in a world, we live in a life that is full of doubt. Uh, we, we have doubts about all kinds of things. We, we doubt people's motives all the time, right? People say, I'm going to do this or I'm going to do that. And you say, well, that's nice, but why are you doing this? You know, why is it that you, what's your motive behind this? I doubt your good intentions. You know, we, we have doubts about um, uh, things like, you know, look at, just look at the media this last year. We have doubts about our media. We have doubts about what's happening in government. We have doubts about where's God in all this sometimes. Sometimes we doubt God, don't we? There's times that, you know, look at, our, look at our personal lives. Look at the state of marriage in our country today. You know, when, when Pete, two, two people come together and they say, till death do us part, you know, sometimes they doubt that question, don't they? Because divorce is rampant. You know, the fact is we, we doubt each other. We doubt even our closest, you know, family sometimes. And the fact is, doubt is something that plagues us. It's something that we, we always have to wrestle with and, and, and move through. And unfortunately, when we talk about the Lord and we, we talk about the Bible and we talk about the things that we are, we are supposed to be unified in faith around in the church, sometimes we have doubts creep in there as well. Sometimes we might doubt, am I really saved? Sometimes we doubt, is God really in control? Sometimes we might doubt, is there something that, you know, um, the church is teaching or the Bible has, and maybe that's not really true. Maybe that's not really the way it is, you know. And the fact is, there are many influences and many reasons and realities in our world that impinge upon our steadfast belief in, in what God tells us in his word. And so... This is, this is the same struggle of humanity that was in Jesus' day as well. The same struggle with doubt. And he, he, he really takes this passage and, and through this, uh, this interaction with the people, wants to give them some specific things to help to remove their doubt. Now, the first thing being, of course, in verse 24 and 25, they come to him and they said, we know what will remove our doubt. Of course, they, they believe that here's how, we, Jesus, if you want us to remove the doubt in who you are, their first thing was, what do they tell us to do? Just tell us. Tell us plainly. Just tell, you, tell us exactly, hey, I'm the son of God, and there won't be any doubt. We'll all agree. You know, this is not, <laughs> this is not the way it was going to work. Obviously, this was not, he wasn't taking the bait on this, uh, this thing. Because the fact is, and this is our first point this morning, that being direct doesn't always remove doubt. Isn't that true? Being direct doesn't always remove doubt about things. You know, you could say, here, this is really how it is. I'm going to tell it to you straight, and you're not going to have any doubt because you can trust every word I say. If Jesus had just simply said to them, I'm the Messiah, trust in me, I'm going to be your Savior, I'm going to die on the cross, and I'm the Son of God, and, you know, that's, that's it. Case closed. Just close, close the Bible, that's all you need to know. Would the people have really believed? No. And Jesus knew that. Because being direct doesn't always uh, remove the doubt. They, they wanted to be told plainly. He, they, they believed that he had not been direct enough with them. But the fact is, he had been very direct in his 
demeanor and in his works and what he had done before them, and yet they, they still weren't getting the point. You know, I, I went to college, and, and when I first got into college, I had met different people. You meet all kinds of people in walks of life in college, and it was a Christian college, but nonetheless, there, there was some folks there that they came from all different backgrounds and persuasions, and I may have told some of you this story before, but one of the first guys I met on my floor as a, as a young, young guy in first fr freshman year in college was a guy who just, he, he was a go-getter. He wanted to tell people about the Lord. He wanted to see people get saved. And one of the first things he asked me after he found out what my name was, hey, do you know the Lord is your Savior? And, you know, and I you know, told him, yeah, I'm born again. And I, you know, I, we talked about it a little bit, and it was good. I thought, well, that's, you know, that's a great idea. And then I went, and I, I, I got to my, my roommate, which I had never met until the day I got to college, right? And uh, this was typically how things were done. I think today everybody, it's social media, and everybody knows everybody before you get there. But I had made no contact with him. I didn't know who he was. So I go in, I introduce him myself to him and and I you know we get to know each other a little bit and he says you know he says I met this guy down the hall and uh, he says the first thing he says to me is are you born again and he says no the fact is this guy probably wasn't born again he had a Catholic background and he didn't really understand what the question was and so when this guy confronted him he says well I don't know and he says and you know what he told me he says well if you're not born again you're going to hell I said, this is the first thing he said when he first saw you? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, most of the rest of that night, I spent talking to him, you know, explaining how this is true. I mean, he was, you know, he wasn't wrong in what he said, but it probably wasn't the best way to, you know, introduce yourself. <laughs> You know, the fact is, he, he was so got much gung-ho in getting the truth across that he just neglected the fact that, oh, well, he'll just believe me and accept Christ right here and now. Well, he needs to know he's going to hell. Well, that doesn't always remove doubt, does it? In fact, I will just tell you, I think my roommate probably went the whole semester. He was only at school one semester before he left. And um, to my knowledge, I don't know if he've ever, he's ever accepted the Lord. You know, the fact is, being direct doesn't always remove doubt. And Jesus knew that. Jesus knew that. And, and they, they felt like he hadn't been direct with him, but yet he had done many miracles. He had demonstrated who he was through the, 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 in the flesh of, of, as being the Son of God. And despite all of the signs that he had given them in his ministry, they still did not believe. And do you realize it's the same thing for us today? It's true. Not everyone who hears and experiences and sees the truth about Jesus Christ will necessarily believe in him. It's just not always true. It was true in Jesus' day. Why would it be different for us? What does the Bible say about Jesus? He came unto his own, and his own received him not. The own, the own people that had been given the scripture, that were looking for this Messiah, that by the signs that he had fulfilled in scripture were, were indisputable. And yet, the own, the, his own people, the people that studied the scripture and had it and knew it, most of the Jews rejected Jesus. Most of them didn't accept him for who he was. And you know, I get comfort from this. And I'll tell you why. Because we're told to go out and be witnesses in this world. We're told to go out and share our faith with others. We're told to go out and bring the gospel to the, the, the world around us and share Christ with people. And you know what? We need to be more diligent about that. But that's not the point that I want to bring from this, this little passage. The point is this. How many times have you shared the gospel with someone and they didn't accept Christ? How many times have you tried to share your faith and it just didn't turn out the way you hoped? And you feel like, you walk away feeling like, man, I really messed up. <laughs> man, if I had only just, you know, you walk away. How many times have you walked away from a conversation and thought back upon it and you say, oh, if I had only just said this. Oh, I couldn't, I couldn't come up with the answer to their question about that. 
If only I hadn't just stumbled over my words and didn't, didn't get it right. If only I just had been able to be more clear. Then they would have. You know what the fact is? Who was the greatest communicator in all of history? <laughs> Jesus Christ. Who was the greatest demonstration of God's power and spirit upon him in all of history? Jesus Christ. And yet, what did the people say to him? Can't you speak a little more plainly? <laughs> we doubt. We doubt in what you're saying. <laughs> yeah, he, he, he's the one, if anybody should have been able to convey what the truth was to people in a way that they would respond, it would have been him himself. And yet, how many times do we walk away beating ourselves up because someone didn't respond the way we hoped, and we say, man, I just didn't get it right. Maybe we didn't explain it clearly, or maybe if I would have said something different, they would have believed. And you know, the fact is, that's not an excuse for us to not know how to present the gospel, by the way. It's not an excuse for us to say, well, I don't know any verses, and I don't really know how to lead someone to the Lord. No, we are responsible to do those things. But when we do our part, we have to say, it's in God's hands. Because being direct doesn't always remove doubt. It didn't in Jesus' case, and it won't always for us as well. Let's look at the second part. Let's look down at verses 26 and 27. He says, um, well, it's 25. He says, I told you, he says, you believe not. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. But ye believe not, because ye are not of my sheep, as I said unto you. Because, verse 27, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. Second thing I think we need to think about in terms of doubt and our relationship with the Lord is sometimes that you may say, I doubt if I, you know, you, we, we, you know I, I said the sinner's prayer. I, I grew up as a, in a church. I, I grew up as a Christian, and I've always told someone that. But the fact is sometimes I just doubt. I doubt whether I, you know, whether I'm really saved, whether I know the Lord. Well, do you want to know something that this is an assurance from? That there may be times that you doubt whether you're the Lord's, but he never doubts those who are his. He never doubts those who belong to him. This is what he's saying here. These people believe, didn't believe me because they're not of my sheep. And he says there's three things that validate who you are in Christ. Three things by which I know, and really you should know, that you're in Christ as well. He says, my sheep, three things. They hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. He says, these are three marks of those who are true believers. These are things that show me without a doubt that they belong in me. They listen. They're people that hear the voice of the Lord. People that are hungry to know God's word. People that are hungry to, to feed on it, to hear God's voice, to see God's direction, to look for him in the, the, the questions of life as they come up. You know, these, these are the people that are, that are looking for God's input into their lives. They listen to him. And it says, I know them. He knows us. He knows every inch of us. And we have a, an innate understanding and belief that, like we talked about before, as the good shepherd... He knows what we need. He knows our insides better than we know ourselves. And he says, thirdly, these people follow me. These, these sheep that I have, they're ones that are following after me. That doesn't mean that we don't get off the path every now and then. It doesn't mean that we don't run astray. Sometimes our own selfish will, our desires, our own flesh takes us off of the path. But the fact is, when you get to the end of it, what is it that you really want in life? Are you really following the Lord? These are indicators that we are belonging to him. Sometimes we begin to question. You say, well, you know, I, I only know I'm saved because uh, I feel saved. <laughs> you know, I feel like God knows me. Or I feel like this is this, is this way or that way. Or maybe I feel like my faith was big enough. Or maybe you question whether your faith was big enough when you prayed that sinner's prayer. And you know what? I think these are, um, 
sometimes attempts at Satan to undermine the doubts that, that, that we might allow to creep in when we forget the fact that really, as true believers, if we're following the Lord, if we're listening for the Lord's voice, if we're, if we're trying to get God's voice in our life by reading the God's word, if we know that he knows us, if we're relying on these promises of God, then we can know without a doubt it's not about how big our faith is. It's about how big our God is. Because he's the one that keeps us in himself. And the fact is, we sometimes try to measure our faith. You ever see something, you know, if I just had more faith, I could, I, I could feel confident about this. But do you know what? Jesus never tries to measure people's faith. The Bible is never a measure. There's never a measuring stick for how great your faith is. Do you know what the Bible consistently tries to measure, though? Is our faithfulness. It's our faithfulness that gets measured. You know, he talks about three things that are very quickly, easily measured. How much are we following the Lord with our lives? You can measure that. <laughs> How much time do we spend trying to get God's word and God's voice into our life? We can measure that. That's areas of faithfulness. How faithful are we about the things of the Lord in our life? How faithful and consistent are we? These are areas that we can measure. And when we see our lives pushing that direction and trying to do our best to follow the Lord, the fact is they are indicators for us that we are part of Christ's sheep, sheepfold. Let's look at verse 28. We'll keep moving. Verse 28, he says, And I give, them, I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father which gave them me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. The third idea about doubt that Jesus tries to bring to the people and bring to us is that there's no doubt about the security we have in Jesus Christ. There should be no doubt in the security that we have in him. And the fact is, what does he say? He says, I give unto them eternal life. They shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. Do you hear the surety in these words? These aren't, well, maybe. I hope that I can keep you people, you know, from escaping. <laughs> I hope, I hope that you people don't, you know, end up going too far astray. I can't get you gathered back. I, you know, it, no, there's none of that. These are definitive, sure statements, statements of security. Security offers eternal life. We shall never perish. No one shall be able to remove us from the grip of Jesus on our lives. And so... While our faithfulness can be measured, as we just talked about, the fact is we are not kept in Christ because of either our faith or our faithfulness. We are kept in Christ because we are secure in him. Our security is found not in what we do and what we keep doing. It's secured because of what Christ has done and does continue to do for us. He keeps us in his hand. Do you realize that if you have a grip on something, that, that uh, you know, whatever it is, maybe it's something that's a, a small child that you have to have a grip on sometimes, right? <laughs> Do you realize that no matter how much they might try to wriggle free from your grip, <laughs> their ability to get away is no greater than the amount of grip that you have in your hand on them, Right? doesn't matter how far they may even try to get away from your grip. Now, you compare that to the picture that Jesus gives us. What grip does the Father have on us when we've placed our faith in him? We might try to wriggle free. There might be times when we go the wrong direction and try to get out of his grasp. But what is he saying? My grasp is bigger and greater and more powerful. You're not going to wriggle free. You can't be plucked from my hand. And there should be no doubt about 
the security that we have in Christ. No one can take us from him. We are in his hands. If we know the Lord is our Savior, then it's not our faith or the sustenance of our own goodness that keeps us in Christ. Was it goodness that brought us to Christ? No. The Bible says you weren't good enough to become part of Christ's kingdom. You weren't good enough to be saved. No one was. Why does it say? Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but by faith he has saved us, right? It's by our grace through faith that we are able to know that we have eternal, eternity secured in Christ. And so in the same way, we can't expect that it's through our own goodness that we can stay saved. No, it's still through his might and his power and his grace in our life. And so we're in his hands. We are in God's hands, he says. He, says. he goes even further. He says, my father gave them me is greater than all, and no one's able to pluck them out of my father's hands. You know why we're in God the Father's hands? Because what are we called as Christians? The children of God, right? We are God's children. We are called joint heirs with Jesus Christ. We are now his child, and as a result, we have an inheritance waiting for us as sons and daughters of God, if we know Christ as our Savior. So we're in his hands. We're in his family now. And we're not going to get disinherited from that. And then Jesus goes on as though these people haven't, they, they asked for something direct. I don't see how you can get more direct than this. And here's what he says. He says, my father, he's... Uh, able to do all these things. They can't pluck them out of my hand. They can't pluck them out of my father's hands. And then he says in verse 30, I and my father are one. I don't know how you can get any more direct than that. This is a claim that Jesus Christ himself was God. He says, if you believe God the Father is God, the God of the universe, the almighty, all-powerful, omniscient God who created everything and sustains everything, if you believe in him, that's me. I and my Father are one. So if you doubt that I can, you doubt what I'm doing, you doubt who I am, he says, recognize who I am because I'm divine. I'm God in the flesh. There's no question. There should be no doubt. Our security for eternity is not bound up in our own goodness, but it's bound up in the grace and the security found in Christ. And then let's look at the rest of the passage here. He says in verse, uh, this is verse 31, the Jews took stones again to stone him. I guess he had been direct enough with them. <laughs> they took the stones up to stone him. And Jesus answered in verse 32, many good works have I showed you from my father. For which of those works do you stone me? <laughs> you know, it's kind of tongue in cheek. <laughs> I've done nothing but good for you folks. Which of these good things are you stoning me for today? <laughs> You know, and I don't, I'm just glad the stones weren't a little closer. They, they took them a little while to find them, I guess. But the fact is, uh, they were ready. They were incited. They were enraged. Here, they saw Jesus as committing blasphemy. He had equated himself with God the Father. And so that's what they say in verse 33. The Jews answered him, saying, For a good work we stone thee not, but for blasphemy. And because that thou, being a man, makest thyself God. You see, Jesus had told them plainly, and they still had doubt. He had told them plainly, and instead of saying, yes, you're right, you are God, what did they do? I'm picking up a stone. <laughs> it's, time to, it's time to send you to the grave, and you are just a man, and we will never see you as something greater than that. And this is what Jesus knew. And yet, he still has grace upon them. And so in verse 34, he says, Is it not written in your law, I said, ye are gods? And if he called them gods, unto whom the word of God came, and the scripture cannot be broken, say ye of him whom the Father hath sanctified and sent into the world, thou blasphemest, because I said, I am the Son of God? Now this can be a confusing passage. <laughs> you know, we... Uh, you go into the cults, if you go to the Mormon religion, they, uh, they like to have a heyday with this one because uh, they believe that we as human beings are gods of some type, some kind of lowercase g, God. 
And uh, if you just read this on the surface, you might begin to say, what is Jesus trying to say here? This seems very convoluted. Why would he bring this passage up? And what does he say? It's written in your law, I said, ye are gods. So what is he referencing? Well, he's referencing a psalm. Psalm chapter 81. Let's just look at this. Turn back to Psalm chapter 81. Because in here we see the context that Jesus is using to make his case about how they can have no doubt that he was to be the Savior. Psalm chapter 81. Uh, that is not right. 82. Thank you. Yes, that's right. I'm glad someone's on their toes. Good. Psalm 82. Let's just look at these verses together. God standeth in the congregation of the mighty. He judgeth among the gods. How long will ye judge unjustly and accept the persons of the wicked? Selah. Defend the poor and the fatherless. Do justice to the afflicted and needy. Deliver the poor and needy. Rid them out of the hand of the wicked. They know not, neither will they understand. They walk on in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are out of course. I have said, ye are gods, and all of you are children of the Most High. But ye shall die like men, and fall like one of the princes. Arise, O God, judge the earth, for thou shalt inherit all nations. Now, who were the gods being referenced to in Psalm 82? That's the question. It's the people of Israel. Isn't this what he's saying? Look at uh, verse 6. He says, I have said ye are gods, and all of you, again, this is a recognition of who they are as people of a God, that God's chosen people. He says, all of you are children of the Most High. In what way were the children and the people of Israel, the Jewish people, to be called gods. Well, what were they? They were the keepers of God's word. They were the ones that were blessed through Abraham. They were the ones that, even through all of the Old Testament, they were called the children of God. And in that way, they were part of his family, right? Everybody here has a last name, right? And that last name identifies you in some way with the family heritage that you were born into. And when we talk about the Jewish people in the Old Testament being blessed through Abraham, all being descended of him, they were all identified as God's people. And in that way, the Bible says you are God's. You are, not that you are divine, supreme, omniscient, great, but that you are identified, you are recognized as special, as set apart, as gods in, in that sense. You are representatives of God here on earth. That's what the people of Israel were meant to be. They were meant to be a testament to all nations, to be the bearers of the, the, the line that would lead to the Savior, to be the keepers of God's covenant and truth from the Old Testament. They were to be God's lighthouse, evangelists, if you will, to the world around them. They were to be representatives of God here on earth. And so the psalmist, what's the, what's the big argument against them here in the psalms? He says, God stands in the congregation of the mighty. He says, I'm standing here as God, right in your midst, you people of Israel. I'm standing in your midst. He judges among the gods, and here's his accusations. How long will ye judge unjustly, except the persons of the wicked? Had the people of Israel accepted wicked people into their midst? Absolutely. How, he says, defend the poor and the fatherless, do justice to the afflicted and needy. Did they stamp on their poor? <laughs> Did they not care for the widows? Did they have problems? Absolutely. Absolutely. He says, deliver the poor, the needy, rid them out of the hand of the wicked. They didn't care so much about that. Look, at by the time Jesus came, how did the Pharisees feel about all that? <laughs> they weren't so inclined to care much about the poor and needy unless it suited them to bring, elevate their status a little higher. They had no real heart for it. He says, they know not, neither will they understand. They walk in darkness. Were the people of Israel in darkness? Certainly by Jesus' time they were. 
These people were being judged for their lack of proper conduct befitting those that should be called the children of God. They are being called in the carpet because they were not recognizing the truth about what God wanted to do through them and in them. And that's why he says in verse 6, I have said you are gods, but verse 7, ye shall die like men. You're the children of God, but you're not acting like it. And therefore you will be judged. And what does Jesus say in context? He brings this up. Let's bring it back to John 10. As children of God, they were to act in certain ways. They were to walk in accordance with their father. And so in verse 34, he calls up this psalm to their remembrance. He says, is it not written in your law, I said ye are gods, verse 34, if he called them gods unto whom the word of God came, and the scripture cannot be worked, broken say ye of him whom the father hath sanctified and sent him into the world thou blasphemest because I said I am the son of God if I do not the works of my father believe me not you see he's equating himself with the answer do you realize the only answer that people can have for the accusations that were brought against them was to be found in Christ there was only one who could truly fulfill the law. There was only one who could truly have a heart for the needy, for the fatherless, to fulfill the commands and to fulfill all the prophecies of the Old Testament. It was only to be found in Jesus Christ. You people were called gods. He says, but I'm the son of God. And the only way you can truly be a child of God is to be found in me. So what is he saying? You should have no doubt about me as your savior. Because in the Psalms, the people were being judged for their lack of ability to live in the ways of the Lord. But Jesus showed that it could now be done through him. That's why he says, verse 38, if I do, though thou believe not me, believe the works that ye may know and believe that the Father is in me and I in him. So he's saying, even if you don't believe my words, look at what it is that I've done. Who have I helped? Who cares for me? Have I fulfilled what you just got blamed for in Psalm 82? Have I been compassionate to the poor and the needy? Have I helped the fatherless? Have I been uh, true with what uh, an understanding of the law and teaching the law and teaching God's truth? He says, yes, I've been true for all of those things. I've fulfilled 82. Those things that you couldn't do, I've done. So he says, even if you don't believe what I'm telling you, look at what I've done. My actions define that. They show you that I've, that I've met those standards. And you realize that in the same way that Jesus shared himself with these people, in the same way, really, that's how we are to share Christ with the world around us. We show it through our works. I'm not saying we need to use our words too. But that's why in Matthew 5, 16, Jesus said, Let your light so shine before men that what? You tell them a really good, you know, compelling story and case for who Christ is and they'll believe in him? No. He says, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works. And glorify your Father which is in heaven. You see, for some of us, it doesn't matter how many good words we might have to say. If our works don't back that up, <laughs> we won't truly be a witness to those around us. And in the same way, that's what Christ was saying. He says, I could talk to you all day. He says, I could talk to you Jews all day. Try to explain plainly. Try to give you illustrations as a good shepherd. I could try to remove your doubt with my words. He says, but you know what's really going to remove your doubt? Is when you look at the character of who I am. The lifestyle I live. The truth that I live out in my life every day. And it's that that you can believe in. Because it is going to be transformative to your life. You know, we have a little saying it's gone around the internet and everywhere we have it 
posted in our in our house. I'm not even sure it's up since the Christmas decorations came down, but we normally have it up. <laughs> and it says this, live in such a way that those who know you but don't know God will come to know God because they know you. Isn't that really the essence of the gospel? People don't know the Lord. People have doubts. And when they look at your life, they shouldn't have any doubt about who it is you live for, who it is you're following, and what your faith is all about. And when we do that, we don't need to doubt our own security, and we don't need to doubt the fact that we belong in Him, and we don't need to doubt in the Savior that's done so much for us. Because that truth will be lived out in everyday ways in our everyday life.